Hello, everyone. This is Aaron Gelb with uh, Conda Sale Carey in the Chicago office, and we are going to get started with our webinar. Uh, Dan Deacon and I will be giving you all an update of developments that uh, recently passed and new laws that are on the horizon, both uh, here where I sit in Illinois, as well as the uh, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area where Dan is located. It's uh, certainly been an, an interesting year here in Illinois. Um, like I said, I'll be diving into the various changes that we've seen. Uh, it's certainly been one of the more, I, I'd say, uh, active legislative years in the past uh, 12 to 18 months here, here in Illinois with more new laws and, and employment regulations being passed than, than I can remember in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, Illinois has for quite some time been a fairly active state, and I, I often joke that we're not California, uh, but we're not for lack of trying, and the legislature is, is certainly trying to catch up as far as regulating the workplace. But the, uh, the sheer scope and, and reach of a number of the laws that were passed during the past year that are, went into effect either in late 2019 or have now gone into effect in 2020 or will soon be going into effect later this year, uh, really require employers to, to take note and uh, sharpen their pencils and get a to-do list ready to go if you haven't already done so. So we're going to walk you through those here in Illinois. And as I said, Dan will walk you through the ones uh, that he's tracking and our office is tracking out in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. Before we do that, we'll just briefly introduce ourselves. We know that you're not here for uh, long bios, um, but I think a little bit of background gives you a sense of who we are and what we do. Uh, so, like I said, my name is Aaron Gelb. I am a partner in the Chicago office. Uh, we opened this, our, our office here in Chicago a two, little over two years ago in January of 2018. I've been a management side uh, employment litigator and OSHA lawyer. For the past 25 years, uh, 20, I'd say about 22 of them here in Chicago uh, for a number of years, almost 20 years with a large uh, international firm here in Chicago. Uh, I represent employers, as you can see from the bio, in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship. Uh, in addition to the occupational safety and health matters that I handle on a daily basis, uh, I, I represent a number of national employers, local employers uh, in EEO matters, providing counseling, training. Um, I've handled probably close to 300 discrimination charges in the last 10, year, 10 years. Uh, I've tried a number of cases uh, to verdict in federal court uh, here in the Midwest, as well as on the East Coast involving sex discrimination, uh, USERA, which is military status discrimination, uh, race discrimination, as, as well as family um, FMLA retaliation and interference claims. So I try to bring a, a balanced approach between counseling and litigation avoidance, and then obviously the defense of, of those types of claims. I'll let Dan introduce himself, and then we'll we'll get started with the content. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, this is Dan Deacon that you hear now, and I am an associate in the Washington, D.C. office uh, I work with both the OSHA and labor and employment practice groups, um, and in doing so, I basically help out all the partners in the firm uh, throughout all our offices um, on, on anything that comes to the door, uh, primarily representing employers during inspections and investigations um, at the federal and state OSHA uh, level, and then I advise and counsel employers um, regarding, regarding notices of employee safety complaints and OSHA citations. And then on the labor and employment side, uh, I uh, represent employers in all aspects of uh, uh, the employer-employee relationship, including wage and hour disputes, claims of discrimination. Um, and being based out of D.C. here, uh, I follow closely all those laws that we're going to be talking about today in D.C., Maryland, and uh, Virginia, um, which are important um, in reviewing and revising your handbooks. Many of those um, are are certainly going to impact the way that you operate, if, uh, especially if you have employees in D.C., Maryland, or Virginia, or you're based there. Um, so your handbook is something that you're certainly going to want to take a look at um, following this webinar. Aaron, I'll turn it back over to you to go through the agenda, and we'll get started. Thanks, Dan. And, and you make a, a really good point. Uh, obviously, handbook reviews are something that, that 
we certainly recommend be done on a regular basis. But given the, the scope and extent of the changes that, that we're tracking both here in Illinois and, and uh, in, in the, the uh, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, this, if you haven't done a handbook review recently, now, now is an a, a absolute necessity to do, do one, in my opinion. Uh, I, I often, when I look at in, the employment law compliance, uh, policies and procedures are, are kind of the most basic building block. And whether you're talking about an investigator from an, a fair employment agency or a judge or a jury, uh, that that's a, kind of the minimum expectation. Everyone everyone assumes that an, a, a, a compliant employer is going to have policies and procedures. So you want to certainly make sure that you've got those. Then the next step, obviously, uh, is to have training so both your employees understand what's expected of them, what what uh, compliance tools are available to them, what reporting mechanisms they can utilize if they have concerns. And that your managers understand both the company's commitment to compliance, the expectations for their behavior, both from how they conduct themselves as well as what they should do if they see or, or observe concerning behavior or be things are reported to them. Uh, so often those that are the, the first line of reporting uh, can, can bungle the response, say things that, that they shouldn't say and, and already put you behind the eight ball. And then, then the final level is, is actually walking the talk and making sure that, that you are, uh, if, if things are reported, that you're investigating them uh, and that you're addressing them. So we're going to, again, go through a number of different laws. Um, as, as you can see from the agenda here, uh, it's a pretty basic agenda. I'm going to cover the Illinois, new Illinois laws. Dan will, will cover those in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. And then uh, we'll try to leave some time at the end for Q and A. Uh, so as far as the Illinois laws, um, the first one I want to start out with this is a fairly straightforward one, uh, although it definitely is going to require a number of employers, I think, to change how they go about recruiting uh, and hiring new talent. Uh, this is the, these are amendments to the Illinois Equal Pay Act that actually went into effect late last year. I've included it in this deck because, it, again, it was it was only late in 2019, but also these are, are significant changes, and, and the number of and changes that, for the most part, I don't want to say were under the radar, but have not been as widely reported or discussed as some of the other new laws uh, that that I'm going to talk about at the end of my portion. I'm going to get into the uh, Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act, which legalized recreational marijuana here in Illinois, and is many of you all may imagine, that has really garnered the, the majority of the news attention and, and discussions, uh, seminars and webinars and everything about this new law because it, it's a big deal. Uh, but this, the, the amendments to the Illinois, Illinois Equal Pay Act are significant for a number of reasons. First, um, un, pursuant to these changes, Illinois employers can no longer screen or disqualify applicants because of their current or prior salary. Uh, this this change is done or was made in, in primarily to prevent the any past discriminatory wage decisions that relate to pay from having an ongoing impact uh, on individuals as they move from one employer to another. Um, so when you, when you look at the statistics with respect to certain groups, uh, particularly women, being paid less than men in certain positions, one way the legislature looks at at, at combating that is to include employers from using past salary or wage information in making decisions on how they're going to pay someone who's applying for a position. So what this means for, for you all that are listening is you cannot require or insist that an applicant disclose his or her salary history, either in order to be interviewed, uh, to be considered for a position, or to be offered employment. Uh, and if you're sitting there thinking, well, okay, I can't ask them, but you know, I know somebody at the company, or I'll just reach out. Uh, kind of as a reference check, and I know some employers may provide last rate of pay, so I'm going to ask that. Um, the law's got, got that covered as well and, and prohibits any effort to make that sort of an end run around the applicant, so employers cannot seek that information from the applicant's former employer. Um, I, I think perhaps most significantly, this, these amendments prohibit employers from factoring salary history in, information into any compensation or hiring decisions even if the applicant provides that information voluntarily without you asking for it. Um, what you can do and should do, however, is ask the applicant what they are looking for in terms of salary uh, 
and then use that as part of your decision making. Um, at the same time, what, what's interesting here is that, that, that in Illinois, you cannot forbid your employees, and the, this, the amendments make clear, from discussing their salary or wages with each other. Um, this probably isn't as significant of, of a factor because the National Labor Relations Board, um, for, as applying to both unionized and non-union non workplaces, has long protected the right of employees uh, to, to talk about their wages, with wages being a term and condition of employment. Uh, the LNRB protects the right uh, of employees to band together for mutual aid and protection relating to such matters. So uh, you're not, hopefully you're, you don't have policies or procedures that, that prohibit this. I, every once in a while I do see it still in uh, offer letters uh, advising uh, hourly employees that, that their salary or their, their wages are are private and should not be discussed. So if you have that in your offer letters or have a policy in your handbook that has that in there, uh, you should take that out. Um, this goes without, it goes without saying though that obviously you can prohibit you know, managers from disclosing uh, and certainly human resources from disclosing salaries of one person with another, uh, one employee to another employee. Um, it, it's, it's, this is a, a freedom that exists within the employees. Uh, amongst the employees. The, the Illinois legislature also made a number of significant changes to the Human Rights Act. Um, and just a, a quick background, here in Illinois, obviously, um, and I would say the majority of the discrimination charges that I deal with are filed with and investigated by the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC. Um, close second would be the Illinois Human Rights Act, which is enforced by the Illinois Department of Human Rights. Uh, if an employer ends up with an adverse finding, a probable cause of termination from the IDHR, uh, the employee then has an option to proceed to a hearing in front of an administrative law judge at the Human Rights Commission. That rarely happens. Most employees opt out and, and go to court um, because the, the ALJs tend to be uh, a lot tighter with the amount of, of damages that they award, and there are also very, a number of differences as far as how litigation proceeds. There are no depositions at the Human Rights Commission. Those of us that, that sit, uh, or employers that operate in the city of Chicago or with Cook County uh, also may find themselves in front of either the Cook County Human Rights Commission or the, the city of Chicago Commission. Um, those are, are agencies that, from, in my experience, employees rarely end up in front of, uh, despite practicing here for over 21, 22 years in Chicago. I think I've only appeared in the city commission maybe five times. Um, and, and often the, the, the more local the commission, the more difficult uh, it is to deal with because they have fewer cases and spend a lot more time on them. Um, but what the, the Human Rights Act here in Illinois, which covers employers throughout the state, uh, perhaps the most significant change is that they, they reduce the coverage of, of the act uh, from most types of discrimination that used to kick in at 15, it's now one employee. So if you have one employee in Illinois, you're covered by the Human Rights Act. The act was also changed to extend coverage explicitly beyond the physical workplace, meaning that remote workers uh, so are protected if people work from home. If your employees are, are harassed or stalked while they're at home, um, that, that is something that now you are expected to address. Uh, I, we are certainly also advising employers to pay close attention to uh, off-site events, holiday parties, retreats, things like that. Uh, because incidents that occur there can can be used to uh, assert a claim of discrimination. So recommend that you treat them as if they had happened, occurred in the workplace. Uh, in the past, and this, this I've never really noticed this distinction at the EEOC, but at the P Department of Human Rights in the past, I've had investigators that flat out told a charging party, I don't want to hear that, that happened on your personal time or that happened when you weren't at, in the workplace. So I, I certainly don't expect to hear that anymore. Another interesting change, I am not aware of any other states that have done this, is that the law, uh, the Human Rights Act now applies to perceived status of an individual. Uh, so that means that someone can bring a claim now that uh, they were perceived as being and discriminated against because their employer thought that, that they were gay or or straight or they perceived as being a certain race, perceived even as being a certain national origin. So you could perceivably uh, encounter a claim where an employee who is from 
Mexico claims that they were treated differently because their employer thought they were from Costa Rica, uh, or a, a Serbian employee who claims they were treated differently because their employer thought they were Croatian. Any number of, of combinations, and this this really presents some challenges, I think, for employers in terms of the, the, you, you can't really control what, what people perceive or how they feel that they're being perceived. What you need to do, though, is, is modify your your policies and procedures and certainly cover this in, in, in the training that you provide, uh, if particularly to your managers, so, so uh, they understand that they shouldn't be, be acting on assumptions or, or, or how they perceive a certain individual. So moving on to, there are also, I'll just briefly cover cover this, I apologize, there's some kind of moving along quickly here. There are some special rules that have also been changed for hospitality employers. Uh, this applies to restaurants, bars, and casinos. Uh, I've already fielded some questions from a number of clients as far as, well, what if we are, are a grocery store or what, are, what if we have, you know, we serve food or we have an area where people can purchase food and then and eat, consume it on our premises. Um, if you have questions like that, whether these rules apply to you, certainly give us a call and we can, can parse the, the, the regulations for you. Uh, but it really is primarily for establishments. The primary purpose uh, for that establishment is to, to provide uh, food or drinks uh, or, or gambling to their customers. So uh, amongst the requirements for employers in this space are to provide employees with personal safety or notification devices so they can summon help. Uh, we've already seen this here in, in the city of Chicago within the hotel industry where, uh, where housekeepers are required to be provided with panic buttons. So if they are, someone attempts to assault them while they're cleaning a room or, or in, a, in a private area, uh, they can summon help. Law also, these these amendments also require uh, that you inform your each of your employees about the protections uh, afforded them by the law with respect to both sexual harassment and discrimination, and give them a copy of your your harassment work free workplace policy. Um, so that that is important. I think most employers certainly are, already do that, but want to make sure that you're documenting that and you're using the uh, making sure your employees are signing the acknowledgments form acknowledgement forms relating to the procedures that are, are provided them uh, and then also uh, there are training requirements as well uh, specific to hospitality employers that go beyond the training uh, requirements that uh, I'll talk about in a little bit uh, with respect to the sexual harassment training that is required here in Illinois uh, one of the other Major changes here in Illinois that went into went into effect this year was the Workplace Transparency Act, um, and, and as this slide indicates, I mean, this is this is a big this this law changes a lot and, and imposes a, a significant number of requirements in different areas. Uh, so it, it apply, if you have an arbitration agreement that covers employees here in Illinois, you need to take note of this law. Uh, if you're term when you're terminating an employee and you're asking them to sign separation agreement, a general release, uh, there are cha it, it changes that apply there as well. Uh, if you're asking for requiring confidentiality is one of the terms in that agreement. Uh, we, we are going to see, uh, I have yet, yet to receive a request for information during a uh, Department of Human Rights investigation, but th th this law uh, permits the investigators to ask for different the new information uh, about past settlements in some cases. Uh, and then there are also disclosure requirements regarding adverse judgments and rulings. So um, a lot to keep track of. So with respect to arbitration agreements, uh, and, and, and by way of background, so you can understand, I think, where the legislature was coming from here, uh, the, the, the WTA was really a response uh, in part and parcel of the Me Too movement and this, this concern or, or perception that employers use arbitration, use confidentiality agreements, as a way to to hide the bad acts of their managers or their employees uh, with respect to to sexual harassment and other forms of discrimination. Uh, so what the WTA prohibits are unilateral agreements. So the sort of uh, arbitration agreement that is just part of the, the the handbook or that someone just everyone has to sign when they start work. Um, if you that's the type of of arbitration agreement that you have. Uh, at least for now, that would, would likely be invalid here in Illinois. I, I expect if some employer has not already done so that someone is going to challenge this aspect of the law. 
uh, and, and, and contend that it, that it violates the Federal Arbitration Act, which, which creates a strong preference in favor of arbitration. Um, if you want to, if you're not one of those employers that wants to get involved in a challenge like that, but you still want to use arbitration here in Illinois, uh, you need to create an agreement that, that represents, as you see here on the slide, a mutually agreed uh, arrangement between the company and the employer. Um, and, and what makes it mutual is that it, it confirms in the agreement that the employees have a right to participate in government proceedings, they have a right to seek or receive legal advice, that they can make truthful statements uh, or disclosures uh, in the connection with investigations or other, other settings, uh, and that they can report concerns that they have uh, regarding un unlawful employment practices. Uh, or criminal conduct, and so when you put those together, what again, what you're seeing here is 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 putting protections in place to ensure that arbitration agreements are not used, uh, in essence, to to keep people quiet and, and pro prohibit or prevent the disclosure of information regarding uh, uh, sexual harassment or discrimination that, that may be occurring at uh, at the, the company. Uh, so next, the disclosures that I referenced, this is, is one of the more interesting aspects of, of the WTA. Um, these disclosures go into effect uh, or will be required beginning in July of this year. Uh, I have yet to see any implementing regulations being passed by the uh, or, or issued by the state as far as how this is going to work. Um, but what employers are going to have to do in some form or fashion once we once we receive those instructions from the state is to affirmatively report to the Department of Human Rights the number of adverse judgments or administrative rulings that the company has received in the past year. Uh, so that would include um, you know, tri losses at trial. Um, I, I, whether that includes uh, probable cause determinations issued, say, by the EEOC or notice a substantial evidence finding, I believe it will, um, but I'm not, it's not entirely clear to me yet. Um, whether an employee obtained equitable relief, so that would not mean something other than monetary relief, so that could be, for example, in the course of a, of a uh, failure to accommodate claim under the ADA that where a court orders an employee be accommodated but doesn't award damages. And then a breakdown of the judgments and rulings by the unlawful employment practice. Uh, I did not list all the, the covered practices that are would be unlawful here in Illinois because there are so many protected classes, but it's basically every type of discrimination um, that is protected under the Human Rights Act. Um, every single one would, would have to be disclosed if there are any judgments or rulings against you. Um, as I said before, it's not clear how uh, the, what the mechanism is will be used. Uh, the IDHR does say, however, that um, in an attempt to assure employers that their private information will not be shared, uh, that they are going to aggravate the data that every company or every employer submits. And so there will be no disclosure um, of personal information, either about the, the individuals who recovered or specific to a certain company. Once that information is aggregated, it's going to be compiled and, and released in, in an annual report uh, published by the Department of Human Rights. Uh, as I said before, also that we we are going to start seeing requests as part of. If you've ever had a charge of discrimination at the Department of Human Rights, you know that you are required to submit a position statement. But then also, the IDHR typically issues a rather lengthy request for information that has a whole host of questions and document requests. Um, and the, what we now will start seeing in those requests for information will be requests to disclose the number of settlements that the company has had in the preceding five years, the number of adverse judgments and rulings. Um, I, presumably, and I, I certainly think, I don't think that they could go beyond this, would, it would be limited to the discrimination claimed by the charging party. So if you're, you're facing a, a, a sex and age case, presumably the request coming from the investigator would be to disclose settlements and adverse judgments relating to sex and age discrimination. Um, I, I often push back or obje object ref and refuse to comply with certain requests that the IDHR makes and wait to see if the investigators will push back. Uh, so it does not necessarily mean that you need to provide uh, all this information, uh, although if you, I, I certainly think because this is a new law that, that they are probably going to watch that closely and, and at least initially 
uh, they, they may seek some way to compel or potentially uh, punish uh, with fines employers that refuse to comply with those requests. Uh, as I said before, another significant change is the requirement here in Illinois of mandatory harassment training. Um, I will direct everybody uh, who's listening, if you're interested, to take a look at the, the blog post that we put up, I think, uh, late last week on this issue. Um, dives into this subject uh, in a bit more detail. The key takeaways here, if you have an employee in Illinois, uh, you have to train that, provide that employee with sexual harassment training. Uh, one, one employee uh, means you're covered by the harassment training requirement. Uh, you have to train your managers. Uh, you have to complete this training by the end of this year um, and then every year after. Uh, so it's going to be a fairly significant undertaking. It's not clear, the law, or I should say the law does not mandate that the training be live, um, whether you, you choose to use online training, pre-recorded videos, webinars, uh, I think there are there is flexibility in that regard. Um, the, the law goes into what the content has to include. Um, there is supposed to be a model program that will be issued by the Department of Human Rights, uh, a training program that, that I certainly would recommend that you incorporate into your, your your program if you're going to do, do the training yourself. Uh, you can use third parties. Uh, we, we've already started doing some of this training, um, although uh, we are waiting for the model program because I, I, I'd be remiss to, to, without warning employers that if, if you do training right now and the model program has something that's not uh, that you haven't covered, uh, then, then you may have to provide additional training. Uh, the second bullet point I talk about being careful about relying on prior training. The law allows you to rely on training that an employee received at a prior employer, but if you're going to do that, you would need to make sure that the training complies with the requirements, and I think that's something that could be rather difficult to do uh, unless they provide you with a copy of the training they received and you review it. I think it's just going to be a lot easier to, to proceed with your own training. Uh, clearly, you need to translate, uh, provide, or I should say provide training in a language that, that, that your employees understanding, understand. Uh, if you have employees that don't speak English and you don't provide training in, the, in a language that they understand, then, then you have not provided them the required training. Uh, for those employers that, that fail to provide the training, there will be kind of escalating fines that, that, that the department can issue. Um, and so it, it's it's certainly something again that, that you've got time. It's it's only uh, kind of the latter part of February, uh, but you certainly want to have plans in place to make sure uh, that you are training both your employees and your managers with respect to uh, harassment, sexual harassment here in Illinois. And I think last but not least, I'm going to do a couple of slides, uh, a few slides on the, the Cannabis Act uh, that I mentioned at, at the start. So this law went into effect January 1st. We had quite a few people that were lined up to be uh, the first purchasers of, of uh, legal cannabis or, or marijuana here in Illinois. Um, without getting too into the, the, the amounts and the weights that you can hold or use, uh, anyone 21 or over here in Illinois can now legally possess, buy or use certain uh, up to a certain amount of cannabis. Uh, what's interesting about the act uh, is that, that it, and it's interesting. Also interesting is that the title is the Cannabis Regulation and Tax Act. Um, so a, a big justification for this was to to raise revenue for the state. Uh, those of you that, that that keep track of what's going on here, you may know that we uh, struggle from a revenue standpoint, a budget budget deficit standpoint. So this was uh, one thing that the state was looking at to to raise revenue, and apparently they've been quite successful at that so far. Um, but the other the other particularly important thing is that the, the Act amended another law, the, the uh, Privacy in the Workplace Act, that protect now means that law, anything that an employee does or consumes off-duty that is legal uh, is protected and they can't, cannot necessarily be terminated for that. So when the law was first passed in June of last year, the uh, regulated employer community was was particularly concerned because the the way the law was written uh, and, and the um, lack of regulations defining it, it appeared to be uh, suggest or suggesting that employers could not terminate an employee uh, if they tested positive positive for marijuana unless there was also a present evidence of impairment. 
So the responding to concerns from the regulated community, the legislature then passed what's called the trailer bill in December that clarified things and, and I think put us back on a much more even footing that, that uh, gave employers comfort. Uh, so under, under the Cannabis Act, zero tolerance policies are still okay. You don't have to allow employees to work while they're impaired by, by marijuana or THC or any cannabis-related products. Um, there's no limit on your ability to punish uh, violations of your drug-free workplace policy. Uh, but the key is to have a policy, uh, have what's called a reasonable policy. Um, again, we don't have any regulations regarding this law either, so we don't know exactly what is defined would be considered a reasonable policy, but in my view, it's it's a policy obviously that puts people on notice. And if you look at the uh, the protections that are afforded under the Workplace Privacy Act and the right to consume products, lawful products off duty, if you have a policy that lets employees know that even though that that cannabis consumption or use is legal that in your work in their workplace that if they test positive for this product or the substance um, while they're at work that they can be they, they can or will be terminated or disciplined in some form I think that is a reasonable policy uh, you know how you go about implementing the policy um, whether you do training whether you, know, you you provide a copy of the policy whether you have a mechanism in place to allow employees to explain a potential violation all make the policy more reasonable. So we've worked with a, lot, a number of clients already in, in reviewing and developing policies uh, to ensure that they they uh, give them an opportunity to comply with with that requirement. Uh, on the uh, the big the big issue or one of the big concerns that employers were wrestling with before that trailer bill was passed at the end of last year, um, because the law appeared to require evidence of pre impairment at the time of a positive test, the employers were, were resigned to the fact that they were not going to be able to do pre-employment testing or random testing because if someone tested positive, they're, presumably they were randomly tested, but they used marijuana a day before, there wouldn't be that evidence of present impairment. Um, but the trailer bill clarified that there is no cause of action uh, for any type of testing if it's done pursuant to a reasonable policy. Um, if you don't have a policy, uh, and I don't know why you wouldn't, but if you don't, um, then the way I read the law, off-duty use is protected, and you could not terminate somebody based solely on a positive test. You would then have to have evidence that they were impaired at the time that they're sent for the test. Um, you can also act based on a good faith belief uh, that the person has is currently impaired at work uh, without sending them for a test. Uh, if you're going to go that route, you, you obviously certainly would want to make sure you have a very um, well-drafted and, and well-trained management team, a well-drafted policy and a management team that, that understands how to, to observe, record, document, uh, and manage the reasonable su suspicion process. Um, because otherwise, it, it, it just, it would, in my view, it would be too, too fraught with risk if you're not also coupling it with a test result. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, the, the, the Act does uh, include a list with various uh, indicator or indicia of impairment, um, bo both what I call observations, so that the person was slurring their word, that they were disheveled, uh, you know, various types of observations like that, and then outcomes such as that they were involved in an accident or they were negligent or something like that. Um, and so I would include those things in, in the policy uh, if, if you're going to develop a policy. Um, the law also requires that you provide employees with an opportunity to explain. Uh, so if you're, base, if you're basing a determination on, on the, these observations and without a test result, you have to give that employee an opportunity to explain themselves. Uh, I recommend including that for employees that, that are terminated pursuant to a positive test as well. I just think it, it, it creates... Uh, it, it demonstrates a sense of fairness in the workplace that will further make sure that your policy is reasonable. Um, and again, I, 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 beyond those elements, uh, we don't yet know at this time uh, if there are other elements that the state uh, would consider as necessary to establish a reasonable policy. But I, I, I think based on my review of the law and, 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 uh, and whatever case law is out there, that, that what we've talked about so far is is going to give you a reasonable policy. 
Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Dan. All right. Thank you, Aaron. And now we are going to get into the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia law updates for 2020 and things to look out in the future. Um, and we're going to begin first with the D.C. TIP Wage Worker Fairness Amendment Act of 2018. And you might be asking, why are we talking about something that happened in 2018? Well, a lot of the implementation dates occur in 2020, um, but there's a little bit of a hiccup that we're going to talk about in a few slides that pertain to budgetary approval. Um, so without getting into too much detail, Early on uh, in our discussion about this law, uh, let's just say that a good majority of the requirements and the provisions uh, of this law are not in effect right now due to lack of budget, uh, budgetary approval. Um, so the DC City Council enacted this law in October 2018 and what it immediately did, one of the um, immediate impacts of the law uh, that occurred um, right when the act was, was promulgated was repealing ballot initiative 77, and that was the Minimum Wage Amendment Act of 2018. It was a voter-approved ballot that had eliminated the use of the TIP credit in Washington, D.C. Um, so with this TIP Wage Workers Fairness Amendment Act, that quickly shut down that uh, voter-approved ballot, and uh, employers can still claim the TIP credit toward meeting the, that minimum hourly wage requirement uh, for TIP employees. The DC minimum wage right now is $14 per hour, um, and employers uh, with TIP employees can claim up to $9.55 in TIP credit. So uh, status quo, basically, from, from where we were pre uh, the Minimum Wage Amendment Act of 2018 and that ballot initiative. Uh, so what are the key requirements of this act outside of that repeal of ballot initiative 77? Well, there's, there's quite a few of them, uh, one of them being a sexual harassment training requirement. So as part of this, all employers, uh, tipped employees, are going to have to provide sexual harassment training to employees as well as managers, owners, and operators of the business, and that must be done on a biennial basis. Um, According to the law, it must be provided within 90 days of hire uh, unless the employee received that training within the last two years. Uh, and the DC Office of Human Rights is supposed to make available a sexual harassment training course uh, and certify a list of providers to give that training. Um, so if the training is given by one of those certified providers, the employer is going to be required to submit a certification to the Office of Human Rights that the training has been completed and that certification is going to need to be submitted within 30 days. So the, uh, the implementation deadline for this sexual harassment training requirement is December 12, 2020. Um, but again, this is one of the uh, requirements that is still subject to uh, budgetary funding, and it is not currently in, in effect, um, notwithstanding that, that deadline, uh, you know, nine, ten months from now in December. Uh, 2020. Um, so we talked about employees as well as managers, owners, and operators of the business receiving training. The one caveat to this training for managers and owners is that uh, they must attend the training in person on a biennial basis where employees can use that online uh, training course. So one of the other requirements, of course, to tag along with that sexual harassment training requirement is a sexual harassment policy. Um, employers are required to maintain a policy uh, that describes how employees can report instances of sexual harassment to management and the DC Office of Human Rights. That policy is uh, supposed to be filed with the Office of Human Rights, distributed to all employees, and posted in a conspicuous location in the workplace. Uh, somewhere where you typically have your workers' rights posters is, is the intent here. And uh, employers of tipped employees are going to be required to document all instances of sexual harassment, um, including you know whether that harasser was a non-managerial employee, a manager, an owner, operator, uh, and so forth. And, and that's going to be reported to the Office of Human Rights. Um, so the deadline there under the law was originally uh, July 1st, 2019. 
Another training requirement uh, under this act is the Minimum Wage Act training requirements. Um, so employers of tipped employees are required to provide in-person or online training on the DC Minimum Wage Act requirements, and that is going to be a yearly training requirement. Um, you're going to have to provide that training to employees, managers, owners, and operators, so basically everyone. Um, and subject to budgetary approval, uh, employers are going to have to submit certification of that training to DC Department of Employment Services. Um, so this training requirement did go into effect uh, 180 days after uh, the the act was was enacted. Um, so the only uh, requirement that is not in effect related to this training requirement is, of course, uh, submitting certification to the DC Office of Employment Services. That is still subject to to uh, budgetary funding. Uh, one of the other requirements is the tipped employee notice requirement. Uh, so covered employers here, employers of tipped employees, need to notify those tipped employees of the minimum hourly tipped wage, the percentage by which tips paid with a credit card are going to be reduced to account for credit card fees, and if the tips aren't shared, that the tipped employees uh, will be able to retain all tips he or she receives. Uh, so you're going to be required to do this at the time of hire and whenever information contained in that notice changes. Okay, so there's basically two, uh, two instances when you're going to have to comply with, with this requirement at hire and any time that information in that original notice provided to the employee changes. That's it. One of the uh, other pretty notable requirements uh, arising from, from this act is the quarterly wage reporting requirement. Um, beginning January 1st, 2020, so just over uh, a month ago or so, all employers of tip workers, with the exception of hotels, needed to begin using a third-party payroll service to prepare its payroll. And covered employers here need to submit a quarterly wage report to the DC Department of Employment Services within 30 days at the end of each quarter. And your, the intent of that is to certify that each tipped worker was paid at least the required minimum wage uh, inclusive of, of gratuities here. And this requirement is currently in effect. So as I mentioned, some of the more burdensome requirements are still subject to budgetary approval and therefore they're not in effect. Uh, those in particular are the sexual harassment policy and training requirements, and then there's a couple different DC government obligations that uh, you as employers don't really need to worry about. These are things that the mayor is required to do, DC Office of Human Rights and DC uh, Department of Employment Services uh, in terms of rolling out the, the, the training uh, slides, the, um, uh, the, the platforms to submit information, all of that, so we didn't get into to those details. But the key ones that still are not in effect due to budgetary funding is the sexual harassment policy and the training requirements. Um, so why are we talking about those? Well, at some point, likely in the near future, these will be funded and they're going to go into effect. So it's certainly something that you as employers need to keep a close eye on throughout 2020. Um, as we anticipate, uh, this at some point this year will, will be fully funded and, and rolled out. The next law that we're going to talk about is the DC Paid Leave Act, uh, and this is another law that has been around for quite some time now, um, but beginning on July 1st, 2020 is the first date that employees, uh, covered employees I should say, can begin uh, collecting benefits under that act. Uh, so what does the act do? We'll just give a general background here. It provides up to eight weeks of paid parental leave to bond with a child, six weeks of family leave to care for an ill family member with a serious health condition, and two weeks of medical leave to care for uh, one's own serious health condition. So DC employees who take this paid leave are eligible for up to $1,000 per week depending on their wage level. $1,000 being the max, though, uh, and as you all probably know, covered employers have already been uh, uh, 
paying a 0.62% payroll tax um, uh, since January 1st of 2019. So what does that put us at? About eight, nine, close to eight, nine months. Uh, employers have been paying this payroll tax uh, for their covered employees. And a couple months from now, uh, five months or so, is the first date that employees can begin collecting those benefits. So what you immediately need to do, and these are a couple deadlines that just passed within the past, uh, past couple of weeks here, is uh, making sure that you have posted that paid family leave notice in the workplace. This is provided on uh, the, the DC um, Department of Employment Services website. Uh, so if you need to still post that, please go to their website, print that out, get it posted at a, uh, on the bulletin board somewhere where you know, you're posting all your other labor law posters, and ensure that any new employees hired after February 1st, 2020 are provided with either an electronic or hard copy of this notice. So uh, some other tips going forward in uh, preparation for the rollout of uh, the program where employees can start collecting benefits, you should receive, uh, review those current and proposed regulations that are out. Those are also posted on uh, DC uh, DOES website, um, including those final regulations for applying and receiving paid leave benefits. Those are set to take effect in a little over a month on March 26, 2020. So some of the key provisions in those regulations that we thought were worth highlighting here uh, during this presentation is that the DC paid leave runs concurrently with federal and DC FMLA protected leave. Um, there's no additional job protections beyond that provided in DC FMLA. Um, and then any eligible individual that is also receiving, un or I should say is receiving unemployment compensation cannot also receive DC paid leave benefits. Um, likewise, any individual receiving long-term disability payments, they cannot uh, be double dipping and also getting DC paid family leave benefits. Um, and finally, an eligible individual's right to employer provided paid leave benefits at the same time as receiving DC paid leave benefits will be determined by uh, an employer's policies. And you can amend your existing policies uh, to, to account for that and we've been getting a lot of questions from, from our clients about how to amend those policies in their handbook. Again, this is one of those areas um, that you should be thinking about, especially since we're about five, less than five months away really from uh, the rollout where employees can claim these benefits. So to the extent that you already have a paid, uh, a paid leave policy for, uh, let's say, maternity leave, um, this is something that you may want to integrate um, with your maternity leave policy. And now let's get into some of the other notable laws that uh, are set to take effect, not just in DC, but also in Maryland, Virginia. We're going to start talking about uh, those states a little bit more here as well. Um, so July 1st, 2020, the DC minimum wage is going to be increasing from $14 an hour to $15. Uh, and the base increase for tipped employees is going to go from $4.45 to $5 per hour. Um, so July 1st, 2020 is a big date, uh, not just for uh, paid family leave, but also uh, the increase in D.C. minimum wage. Uh, the Maryland minimum wage went up on January 1st, 2020. It increased to $11 per hour. Uh, caveat that with Montgomery County and Prince George's County, they do have a higher minimum wage than uh, that required under state law. Uh, so Montgomery County minimum wage will be increasing July 1st, 2020 uh, to $14 per hour for large employers, and that's employers with 51 or more employees. It'll be $13.25 per hour for mid-size employers, um, those with uh, 11 to 50 employees, and then $13 an hour for small employers, so those with 10 or fewer employees. Uh, Prince George's County, uh, their minimum wage is, is not uh, affected 
this year or increased. Uh, so let's talk now about uh, something that Aaron um, discussed in, in his part of the presentation, and that's uh, marijuana laws. Of course, in Illinois, there was the rollout of, of their new law on uh, January 1st, 2020. Um, D.C. has already taken steps to uh, decriminalize marijuana uh, and, and uh, the like, but as far as employment protections go, drug testing, there really hasn't been any substantive law on that front. Well, there were two bills introduced in the D.C. City Council to eliminate drug testing employees for marijuana. Uh, those were the Prohibition of Marijuana Testing Act of 2019 and the Medical Marijuana Program Patient Protection Amendment Act of 2019. Uh, that's a mouthful. They both uh, had uh, a little bit different um, uh, requirements or provisions, I should say, but that second one, the Medical Marijuana Program Patient Protection Amendment Act, uh, that was actually already rolled out as an emergency legislation in June 2019, but it had only been, it only went into effect for, for 90 days. And that was only applicable to DC government employees. Um, so that's just an example of the, the progressive um, laws that DC City Council has already, uh, I guess you, should, you can say already did implement as emergency legislation and is still uh, looking to roll out as, as permanent law but it's something to keep in mind for uh, private employers as well. This is something that's likely coming down the pike, and that's what you see in, in that other bill that was introduced, the Prohibition of Marijuana Testing Act of 2019, that proposes to eliminate marijuana drug testing as a condition of employment unless required uh, by law, such as DOT mandatory post-incident testing and the like. Moving on to what's going on in Virginia, um, this is a pretty interesting development. Just before the end of 2019, a bill was pre-filed in the Virginia House of Delegates um, seeking to de decriminalize marijuana and allow adults 21 and older to possess and purchase, purchase cannabis from licensed retailers. Uh, they want to impose a 10% tax um, on those retailers to fund veteran initiatives, transportation, and lo local municipalities. So what they're going to be doing with funds uh, uh, out of that program is pretty transparent. Um, and it does have employment protections, um, which appear, based on the pre-bill that was filed, they appear to limit an employer's ability to discipline employees for uh, off-duty conduct, basically, using marijuana outside of the workplace. So marijuana is becoming a hot button issue in Virginia. Not saying that anything's going to be done in 2020, but something to keep an eye out on, especially uh, as, as Democrats um, continue to push these efforts in, in the state legislature. So again, right before uh, the holiday season, at the end of 2019, Democratic Attorney General Mark Herring held a cannabis summit in Richmond to discuss these very issues, decriminalizing marijuana and, and comprehensive marijuana reform. Um, so this is something that is going to be pushed uh, and discussed in, in the next upcoming few months here in Virginia and something that you as employers definitely need to keep an eye on. All right, so now we have a few um, Maryland-specific laws that were passed in 2019, and some of them did go into effect in, in late 2020, or I'm sorry, did go into effect in, in uh, 2019, but something that we thought would be uh, important to highlight, uh, especially as, as we bring in the new year here and you're looking at your uh, employee handbooks, things to update. But also, as it relates to this, what you see on the screen here, non-competes and conflict of interest clauses to the extent that you have um, non-competes or employment agreements that um, uh, are in violation of this new law, it is considered void against public policy and something that you should consider revising and addressing sooner rather than later. So Maryland employers are prohibited from including non-competes or conflict of interest clauses in any employment contract with an employee earning $15 or less per hour, or $31,200 or less annually. Um, this is something that has been uh, pushed out in a number of other uh, 
States, uh, and it, it seems to be a growing trend. There are similar bills introduced in D.C. and Virginia, but they haven't passed yet, uh, so there's nothing officially on the books in D.C. or Virginia, but again, something to keep an eye on. It wouldn't be surprising in the next year if we see those, uh, those bills that were introduced in D.C. and Virginia pass. The Maryland Workplace Harassment Amendment, this one is uh, pretty significant, uh, not in terms of something that you need to update in your handbook or anything like that, but um, something to, to keep in mind um, because it certainly impacts the scope of liability for uh, workplace harassment. There are a few key changes uh, to the Maryland anti-discrimination law, those including uh, changes to the definitions of employee and employer. Uh, empl the definition of employee was expanded to include independent contractors. Uh, the definition of employer was revised to increase the scope of liability for cases of harassment from any employer with 15 or more employees to any employer with just a single employee. So that's a pretty significant uh, change there. Uh, a definition of harassment was specifically outlined and then finally, the time period for filing a complaint was expanded from two years to three years. Um, so again, under Maryland anti-discrimination law, there is significantly uh, more uh, risk, I guess you can say, of, of uh, workplace harassment complaints being filed, especially with these key changes to the definitions and that time period for employees to, to file complaints. Maryland organ donation leave. Um, again, if you are thinking of updating your handbook or your leave policies, this is something that you want to uh, take note of. As of October 1st, 2019, employers with 15 or more employees are required to provide eligible employees, and those are employees that worked for the employer for the uh, preceding 12 months and worked at least 1,250 hours during those 12 months. Uh, they're going to be eligible for up to 60 business days of unpaid leave in any 12-month period to serve as an organ donor, and 30 business days within a, uh, any 12-month period to serve as a bone marrow donor. And uh, note that, that this leave does not run concurrently with leave taken pursuant to the FMLA, and that's specifically stated in, in the law itself. So that is, is pretty significant. Now, with that being said, it looks like we... Uh, we're right on time this, uh, this webinar. We didn't go over it all, um, but we do have a number of uh, webinars coming up throughout the year. We do one a month, and uh, as you see on the screen here, this is the list uh, of our upcoming webinars. The next one's going to be on Wednesday, March 25th, covering whistleblower and retaliation issues and strategies that you can take to address those issues. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat function. There should be a box at the bottom or the top of your screen, and we'll do our best to answer those now. But if not, feel free to reach out to either Aaron or myself. Our contact information is included on the screen uh, that you see here. And then finally, we'll be uh, sending out an email with a link to the recorded uh, webinar uh, sometime shortly after, after today's. Uh, conclusion of today's webinar. Aaron, I'll turn it over to you if you want to wrap up with any final thoughts. Sure. Thanks, Dan. And I, I see we do have a couple of questions. Um, so I'll, I'll, it looks like they're both about Illinois. Um, one of them deals with whether uh, legal limits for impairment relating to cannabis can be included in a policy like uh, alcohol. I have not seen that. I don't think that there's any reason why you, you couldn't do that. My understanding, however, of the, the science surrounding uh, impairment by or, or from cannabis is, is that we don't have that sort of information uh, or, or really a test that, that can measure uh, the amounts like we see with alcohol. Um, but as that changes, uh, if a test is developed, then I, I certainly think that that would be something that, that can be included and, and should be included in a policy. Uh, as far as the, the other question uh, deals with uh, an employer that, that has its home, home office uh, in Illinois, uh, 
um, but also opened uh, a branch in another state with employees who reside in that state who, who may come to work in Illinois uh, in, infrequently. And the question is whether those, those people would be required to complete sexual harassment training. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's is a, a pretty a practical as much as a legal question. Um, I, I, I think that there certainly is an argument that they, you would not require to provide uh, training to people who, who live and work in another state simply that they pop into the office from time to time. Um, you know, if, certainly if it's kind of in a transient matter for meetings uh, or, or an event, I, I certainly don't think that they would have to be trained. But if if they rotate through or work on a semi-regular basis, then I'd, I'd probably err on the side of training them. So I think that's, I don't know if there's uh, any other questions, if not. Um, yeah, we have one question uh, regarding well, DC like paid for you here. Um, in the written policy stating that an employee must work in D.C. 50% of the time. That is the definition of a, a covered employee, yes. Um, but it looks like someone was told a representative at Department of Employment Services said that if you're paying unemployment insurance on the employee, they are covered. Which is it? Um, so as far as the application goes, the uh, plain reading of the uh, the law, it, it is 50% of time, um, uh, spending 50% of their time in D.C., at least 50% of your time in D.C. working for the employer. Um, but as far as the unemployment insurance piece, if you are uh, paying D.C. unemployment insurance on, for that employee and they're based out of D.C., that, that likely applies and they would be subject to the D.C. paid family leave. Uh, law requirements. Um, that's something that may be uh, specified more so in the regulations, which I can take a closer look at. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me uh, by email as well, and I, I can dig a little deeper into to the, the answer for you. All right. Thanks, Dan. Well, I think with that, those are uh, all, all the questions that we have. So thanks again for every, to everyone for joining us for this webinar. We hope you found it helpful. And uh, as Dan said, we are more than happy to answer questions about any of these laws, uh, provide, with, provide you with uh, training or, or policies or anything along those lines. So thanks again and have a great day.